Hi, this is Dr. Peter Osborne with Gluten-Free Society, and I'm on the phone with Dr. John Sims, a veterinarian doctor, and um, I'm going to turn it over to him and let us tell, him, tell us a little bit about his background. How you doing, Dr. Sims? Doing great, Peter. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, and uh, doing, doing quite well, actually, thanks to the things that we're going to talk about today. I actually, at, at age 56 right now, I feel better than I ever have in my entire life. And if somebody, if somebody had told me 10 years ago that I was going to feel this good, I would have said, uh, what do I have to do and how much? <laughs> and uh, thankfully, as you and I know, it's not, a, it's not a matter of how much. It's what you have to do. So, uh, so I'm, I'm glad to say I'm, I'm doing real well. Um, the, you know, I've been a veterinarian for 30 years uh, now, almost 30 years to the day, actually. Um, graduated from Auburn University in '79 and did a did an internship at, at Angel Memorial in Boston. Um, and while I was there, ended up um, meeting somebody that worked at a hospital that ended up becoming my wife. And uh, so I've been happily married for all of this time. Um, but um, been doing small animal practice for most of my life. But all of a sudden, everything changed my entire life, uh, personally, professionally, even spiritually, to a great extent changed um, 10 years ago when I found out about uh, my gluten intolerance. And it was a really interesting, uh, to use the word serendipitous, I guess, although um, um, uh, that, that, that's a common word, commonly used word, but it, it, was, it was clearly meant to be. Um, I was in my office one day, and my brother walked in with, a, with a, an email that one of his friends had sent to him that, uh, that really literally came out of the blue. And his, his friend was an Internet researcher, kind of like you and I do, Peter, looking for answers to things. And he came in with this thing about celiac disease. And I remember the day like it was yesterday. And uh, I was standing there in my exam room um, on about four different prescription drugs and suffering from allergies and insomnia and inflammatory bowel disease and depression and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and a list of other things. And my brother hands me this piece of paper that has about 15 points about celiac disease. And my brother... That summer had lost 40 pounds, was iron deficient anemic, was life-threateningly so. The doctors were, were, were confounded. They were about to open him up to try to find the cancer that he didn't have. And then my brother ended up with this email. And so I looked at this email, and I, um, and I, uh, I said to my brother after reading it, after my jaw dropped and hit the ground really hard, I said, well, Bob, go get tested because this is you. And he said, well, how do you know? I said, because this is me. I said, it describes me to an absolute T. Everything that's wrong with me is on this list. And for emphasis, Peter, the, the 15th thing on the list <laughs> was gluteal wasting in children. Now, <laughs> a, lot, a, a lot of people know that celiacs suffer from, you know, this disease we call no but at all disease or something like that. <laughs> you know, and, and nobody, nobody in the Sims family has a derriere. You know, we're like, like George Carlin said, we're a straight shot from the shoulders to the heels. You know, you need to, you need to wear a fat wallet and a couple of handkerchiefs so that you'll have a little shape. You know, <laughs> all, all, part, all part of George Carlin's routine. And so I'm sitting here looking at that, and that was like the exclamation mark on the end of this long sentence. I just went, oh, my gosh, right down to the fact that I've got no bottom. This is unbelievable. You know, so uh, he went and got tested. He was positive. I, I, I swore off gluten at that moment. I mean, I said no more gluten for me at that moment. And my life changed. I mean, on day four, I woke up feeling like I didn't need coffee for the first time in my life. By the end of the week, my pain threshold had gone up, and, and, uh, and I felt like I could stop drinking coffee and stop taking the prednisone. I would sometimes take off of my own shelf to go play golf with my buddies. I hurt so badly. Uh, by the end of the month, I was playing 36 holes of golf and not even taking an Advil afterwards, and my laser, my concentration on the golf course was so focused and laser-like that I thought I was going to actually burn a hole in the ball. Um, it, a complete departure from how I had felt. And so, um, and so everything changed, you know, all from being gluten-free. But then, the, as you know, there's more to the story, but, uh, but that's kind of the background of how I got into what I do now. Can I ask you how you were diagnosed? Was it a biopsy? Was it a blood test? Or, well, actually, I was diagnosed by proxy um, because I was never tested. I, I never. Oh, so it was, your, it was your brother that was tested. My brother was tested. My father was tested, and he was found to be positive. We tested everybody in, in our extended family. My son tested positive. Um, and my, my daughter tested negative, and that made all the sense in the world when I reviewed their childhood diseases and their responses to things. 
Um, and um, and so uh, my son tested positive, my father tested positive, so you know I was obviously the link. And so actually, I've I've never been tested for anything. It's all been a matter of uh, it's all been a matter of response to changes in my diet, and and uh, and and then found out later that dairy, soy, and corn were were doing about as much harm to me as the gluten was. Okay. Yeah. Well, the proof is always in the pudding, as I like to say. Right. Yeah, absolutely. If it if it feels better do it, not doing it, then obviously you want to go in that direction. Right. But with such a strong family history, certainly. Right. So I can, you know, that's what some people question, you know, that if I was never tested, then how do you know? And you go, well, you know, I, I, it's the same way I tell people, and I'm sure you do too, you know, that, that yes, you can go get tested. We recommend testing, you know, uh, but if you end up being negative, we know now that there's a, there are reasons for that on a lot of these tests. And, uh, and still, the, the, for those who can't afford health care um, or, or testing and that kind of a thing, then the, still the best test is to go off of it and see how it makes you feel. And, uh, and like I tell people about that or about taking supplements and everything, you say not everybody can afford health care, but everybody can afford to stop eating pizza for a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're absolutely right. And I get so sick of people coming out and saying, well, you weren't formally tested, so... You know, you're not really one of the crowd. You're not really one of us. I get I get that a lot, and there's almost like this rite of passage that they expect you to go through uh, to be one of them. A lot of the celiac uh, diagnosed patients, I've I've had that almost like an animosity thrown at me by a number of of folks, and I, it was always kind of a strange thing to me because this is one group of people who want to do so much to get their point out. And to get right. gluten out there as a rec commonly recognized thing, and here, you know, in the last 10 years, it's people like yourself that have just challenged yourself with a diet change that feel better that are the ones that are making gluten-free such a household name. So I never did understand that. Uh, well, thankfully, that. I think that's about to change, Peter. I, I really do because, as as we know, you know, the word celiac disease is becoming is becoming less less and less meaning. You know, I think we're gonna we're gonna pretty much drop that term. It's one of the it's one it's been one of the things that's been holding us back. One of the reasons why the medical profession uh, has, it was so slow till recently to pick it up because they were looking for that classic celiac who was losing weight, iron deficient, anemic, bloated, whatever, severe dysentery forever. Um, you know, and and they said you know they, that's what they were looking for, and actually they were they were right in one regard when they said that that was uncommon. But uh, you know, when I was diagnosed ten years ago, the official the official stance of the medical profession was that it was a rare disorder happening in less than one in five thousand people. And um, and when I started doing my uh, my research on this and found that you know one in a hundred Italians at that time were, were officially diagnosed and and it was it was very common in Scandinavia and the United Kingdom where a lot of people in this country came from, then you kind of go. <clears throat> To use a term that is incongruous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I started writing to one of my best friends who's a medical, who's a veterinarian, I mean a doctor here in Mobile, and uh, and, and he's the one that wanted, wondered, still wonders to this day why I didn't become an MD and why I settled, quote, for being a veterinarian, and uh, and I started writing to him, and he said, John, John, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the fact that you're feeling better and that you found a diagnosis, but this is very common among patients when they finally get diagnosed with something, then they see it in everyone. And I said, <laughs> no, well, you're right about the second part. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I do see it in everyone, but it's not my imagination. I said, you, you just wait and see. And he's the one who ended up sending me the New England of Jar the New England Journal of Medicine article about uh, uh, 14 months later or so, uh, stating that uh, celiac disease was the, one of the most underdiagnosed conditions in the country and was happening at least in one in 250 people. 